Congressional focus on MA diverts congressional attention from Medicare program cost containment, sustainability for the program, and improve benefits for those within the program whose needs are greatest. A quarter century of experience with Medicare private plans shows that private plans using public monies are a shameless giveaway with no clear social benefit to private insurers. For the nation, Medicare advantage is Medicare disadvantage. We must learn from this experience as we discuss health care reform for the non-elderly. <clears throat> the overwhelming national interest is containing costs. One proposal to reform is to introduce a, a public single-payer Medicare-like plan to compete with private plans. We know Medicare Advantage costs more than single-payer Medicare, even while undermining Medicare's fiscal viability. We know private plans competing with a public plan are not being honest. Continuation of private plans in MA and in health care reform assures continued administrative costs, 25 percent for insurers, 10 percent additional for providers. Expenditures can best be contained in health care reform by establishing a single-payer public plan for all, which would save $400 billion annually in administration, decrease provider costs, assure continuity of care and coverage, provide universal access, and initiate essential system reforms containing costs. A combination of private and a competing public plan in health care reform is a mirage, assuring continuing health care inflation and exploitation of the public good to serve a private interest. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to questions. Yes, I'm honored to introduce uh, one of the greatest members of Pro's, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lake. Um, she hosted a town hall meeting in Houston that I had the pleasure to go to with Congressman Connors with a packed house of doctors and nurses and social workers. And you, you can best believe that Congressman Massa and Congressman Sheila Jackson are going to be two leaders in this Congress for a real guaranteed universal health care. But without further ado, please, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And let me uh, add my appreciation to the distinguished uh, panel, uh, doctors, advocates, medical professionals, uh, plain folk, as we call it in Texas. Um, that have come here today, and there's nothing like hunting out good things, and uh, I knew you were here, and I had to hunt you out. Uh, so I apologize for having to be in betwixt and in between two meetings, but I wanted to be here with Congressman Massa, who has shown himself to be an outstanding leader and contributor to this process in his first term. And I'm delighted to be able to work with him. His presence in upstate New York, a very large state, complementing with states like Texas and smaller states like Vermont and big states like California, gets the word out uh, that we are uh, in serious, uh, we mean business, uh, and um, as we say in Texas, the only thing good in the middle of the road uh, is a dead amadillo. So we're not trying to be uh, <laughs> on the road, uh, we're trying to be on the spot. Uh, and uh, let me give you some procedural hope and also some challenges. Uh, I've worked uh, on the 676 legislation uh, for at least two sessions, and as uh, was indicated, uh, we had a very productive session in Texas, uh, right next door to the Texas Medical Center. Huge conglomerate of hospitals and research institutions, uh, and a great interest was shown. Everyone recognizes uh, from the birth of uh, one's uh, newborn child uh, to the end of life that there needs to be an overhaul of the system. Anyone who is caring for elderly parents uh, who are now in that pool of uh, vast abyss, how do you deal with an insistent parent who is um, cerebrally alert, a uh, person that doesn't have Alzheimer's maybe, and 
physically cannot function? Uh, is it a nursing home? Is it the spiraling cost that will literally bankrupt the parent or you have to bankrupt the parent uh, in order for them to enjoy uh, minimal quality of life um, at the end of life because there is not um, a, a vast uh, assistance on that end. A lot, don't, a lot of persons, when they think of the reform of health care, don't think of people in their different stages of needs of health care, and that is very important. We have spent the last two weeks, I am vice chair of the Progressive Caucus, and I bring you greetings from them. Um, a uh, former vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, greetings from them. Uh, and uh, we have spent time, along with the leadership of the Hispanic Caucus, and I know that uh, Blue Dogs are focused on this, I know that uh, the New Dems are focused on this, and that's the goodness of the Democratic Caucus. We have a big tent. But we spent our time uh, whipping on the question uh, that is a little narrow than universal access to health care, but that's where it gets us, and that is the public option. Uh, the universal access to health care was probably the first core group of people who brought the concept of public option to the table. Uh, and the good news is that as we are learning the concepts, uh, and I think meetings like this are vital, uh, we have a lot on our plate, but to have a refined understanding leads to the catastrophic reform in health care that we want to see. And so we are accepting the challenge, which has been going on now with the universal access to health care town hall meetings and round tables that have been going on almost for two terms, uh, two of our terms. We're now uh, on the message of educating people about these terms, universal access, public option, combination, public-private partnership, is if you don't get members of Congress where they feel comfortable with the language, the lingo, and what it does, uh, then as we begin to write legislation, which I understand uh, we will be doing uh, during this uh, work recess that we have, uh, the discussions will begin, uh, meetings will begin, a lot of committees have jurisdiction, then we can't get to where those of you in this room want to be. And that is to fix health care uh, without an amending process. And I know there will be amended language but wouldn't it be a shame if we didn't accept this moment in history with a president that understands and cares, with the voices of America being raised up all over, with the horrible stories of an 8 or 12 year old that literally died in an insurance company's office because they had denied her the right uh, to a procedure which would have extended her life. By the time they finally were able to give approval, she and her family were in the office and the doctors, the physicians um, said it was too late. How many more stories do we want to have happen? So I'm trying to get my members to understand that this is a historic moment. This is at the proportion of uh, sort of the FDR moment, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, Medicare in the 1960s. And you have to adopt that kind of attitude, do or die. Those of us who are opposed to the Iraq War uh, used a, a, a fatal statement, and uh, it's somewhat fatal because our work uh, was not complete. We didn't have uh, the four corners of a president uh, to understand our message, which not on our watch. We were proven right. Even as we look to the restoration of Iraq now, I believe we were proven right. Uh, we have to have that kind of attitude on health care, but we have to educate ourselves. You cannot educate yourself and then no one else. And so each one teach one. I've got to be more educated. I've got to understand the nuances of the public-private partnership. What is the sole public option? What does it mean not to have it? What do you do with elderly people? Um, and, and what do you do with people in the different stages of their life? People who are with fatal illnesses, uh, not fatal, but with catastrophic illnesses in the prime of their life, 30, 40, 50 years old. Then what do you do with the elderly? What do you do with children's diseases? What do you do when you have hurricanes and you have uh, governors like I have in the state of Texas and regions who initially closed a uh, University of Texas uh, medical branch, one of the few indigent care medical branch hospitals in the nation. 